Thank you. That's so much easier having someone else introduce me than having to do it myself. So to get started, who here works one-on-one -on -one with clients? Put your hands up. A reasonable number. Are you at capacity and don't have time to take on more clients? Anyone here? Or would you like to perhaps cut back on the time that you're currently spending and have a little bit more work-life balance perhaps, if that even exists? <laughs> yep, totally. So this talk is about creating your first online course. Uh, Warren and I created our first course at the beginning of this year after a couple of years of talking about it and we finally decided to bite the bullet and just do it. So shooting for the stars here. When people think first about creating a course, they think that they're going to become millionaires overnight. I'm here to burst your bubble a little bit straight up and say, it's not going to happen on the first time you launch your course. We thought it would, and we thought we were going to be able to give up, or Warren thought he'd be able to give up his day job, but we're not quite there yet. So have realistic expectations right from the beginning, but it will be a good way to make money if you continue and persevere. You'll be able to make that money with less effort once the initial planning and implementation happens. And theoretically, you'll have less client headaches because when you're working in a group with people, there are less one-on-one -on -one expectations to what you'd normally have with your one-on-one -on -one clients. And in reality, you'll be able to help more people. Obviously, we've all only got so many hours in the day and we can only help so many clients if we're doing one-on-one -on -one work with them. By creating a course with the skills that you've got, it means that you can reach a broader audience of people and you can help them to actually help themselves. Oftentimes, we've noticed with clients who are just starting out in their business, they actually don't need that one-on-one -on -one work. They do want to learn how to do it themselves and they're practicing. While they're learning to do it themselves, they're practicing so that then they're a better client for someone else down the track. So moving from one-on-one -on -one work to creating your online course. First step is planning. It's really important. You want to assess the market. Now, to do that, you need to be asking people that you're already working with what they want. It's the, the most obvious way. Survey those clients, send them a questionnaire, uh, ask them what they want, ask where their troubles are. Some, actually, I'll step back. Asking them what they want, sometimes they really don't know what they want. So it's better to ask them what problems they have, what they'd like to achieve, where they're at now, so that you can start to get a bigger picture of who they are and where your skills might be a match for their needs. You want to join some online forums and see what problems people are coming up with. So for me, uh, I belong to a few Facebook, very active Facebook groups, and I spend a lot of time in Facebook. It's market research. It's not wasting time at all. Um, and seeing what people are actually asking for, because that's where they're raw and they're real, and sometimes a survey can give you false results because people answer what they think you want to hear. Whereas when they're asking questions in a forum of some sort, they've got problems at that point in time. So you can start building a little you know, screenshot file, just take a snap screenshot of those questions, store them away in a file, and then you can, as you build up, you can start looking at these and see how, what things you're seeing come up. Uh, you can also Google if you're up with searching on Google and seeing what keywords come up and looking at the suggested searches in Google, you'll also get some ideas from there. So basically what you're wanting to do is find out what the market needs and what they'll actually pay for. It's the holy grail. Also in planning then, from your perspective, you want to assess what strengths you have, where your skills lie, the things that you like to do. Uh, I think Troy mentioned this morning to make sure that you're doing something that you know how to do. Uh, Nikki, in her presentation about the magazine, do something that you know how to do because it's easier to get started with your skills than it is to try and find other people to bring in. Find out, have a look at what your current clients are raving about in their work with you. So look at your testimonials, 
If you haven't been collecting testimonials, it might be a time to send another email to your existing or previous clients to ask them for their feedback from working with you so that you can start to see what things they see in you that are great. What do you feel comes easy to you? If you're starting out with a course, there are already going to be plenty of things that are going to challenge you in getting the course set up. So you want to make sure that at least the content that you're delivering in the course is something that comes naturally to you. And of course, what do you enjoy? If this is going to be a new income stream for you, there's no point going into a place that isn't going to be fun, that isn't going to fill you with joy. You want, it to, you want your workplace, you want to create a workplace that you want to work at. And then you want to find an overlap between what you love and what the market needs. So packaging up your course. You want to work out a minimum viable product. Because even though you've asked the questions and you you've may have gotten some great answers back, there's still going to be uncertainty there because you're not going to know what the market will specifically pay for. So you don't want to spend months and months and months, years, uh, creating something that's massive that perhaps no one's going to buy. Think about what, out, what are the absolutely essential outcomes for the client. What are they going to want to achieve by the end of the course that you're providing? And obviously then a smaller scope will allow you to get it out faster. It took us two years of thinking before we actually finally got a course out. And when we got it out, it was a minimum viable product and it was quick and it worked better than we could have expected. And we kicked ourselves thinking, why didn't we do it sooner? And you can always expand on the course. You can, start, you can start your very first one as a pilot program, price it a little bit lower to get more people in, or even ask for beta testers at a, a reduced price so that you can get a feel for how things are going. And then you know that you can add pieces later on as you get feedback from that first round of the course. So create a course outline, dot points, modules, lessons. Think about those objectives and the outcomes that people would want and then work back from there to work out what your plan will be for your course. And then break all of that down into logical modules so that it flows nicely. You can think about it a lot and you can plan it on paper, but it's not until you actually deliver it that you'll get the direct feedback then whether that logical sequence that you thought was logical actually works as logic for your clients. And also then break those modules down into lessons that are bite-sized pieces for people to consume. And delivery strategy. So you've got two options. You can do live webinars or you can do pre-recorded. We chose, we thought we were going to do pre-recorded, but we ended up choosing live webinars because that was the quickest way for us to actually get the course happening. Uh, do you want interactivity? The great thing about doing the live webinar was that uh, Warren ran the course, he was on a webinar, people were able to sit there and ask questions, so that meant that if there was something that he explained that they didn't understand, he could go in a little bit deeper or he could go a little bit quicker through things that no one was asking questions about. Whereas doing it pre-recorded the first round, you may not know until after you've created the content and after you've delivered it whether it's appropriate for your clients. And of course, which one are you more comfortable with? It is very confronting to be on a webinar. Even though you're just looking at a camera, it's not live in front of people like this, it still brings your stuff up for you. And if you feel that that might be a little bit nerve wracking for you, then go for a pre-recorded. Because then you've got that opportunity to go back and redo it. But then how quickly do you want to get started? It takes time for pre-recording takes time if you have to do multiple edits, whereas with a webinar it's as simple as once you've launched your course, announcing, turning up to the webinar, delivering the content and there you are. So the strategy launch versus evergreen. So with a launch, uh, if 
your, if any of you are in the internet marketing world, there are multiple theories on, on launches. There's Jeff Walker's product launch formula. There are other similar things. Launching is stressful and it takes time. And there's, you might, I know that we looked at it and I looked at it and I thought, oh, I don't want to have to do that. I don't want to do that part. I don't feel comfortable doing that part. And it's not until after you've launched that you realise there's a reason for all of those things and they're there to help prime your prospective customers. Uh, so launches will build buzz and they will tap into that scarcity for your client and get more people signing up. Whereas for Evergreen, something that's available all the time, that they can go to a page on your website and it's there and they can sign up at any time and that would be for something pre-recorded as well. There's not that urgency there for them to actually sign up because it's there all the time. They can do it at any time they feel like. Uh, as I said, Evergreen requires a sales page, but it takes time to get people to know about you and to get people to that page. Uh, and the launch requires more work up front, but it generally results in more sales initially. So then looking at the content availability, are you going to have that content available all at once for them to access instantly? So if someone wants to binge over a weekend, they can just run through all of it for the course over the weekend? Or do you want it dripped out so that people have to complete or it more encourages them to complete each module as they go along? With Dripped, you've got more time to create. So as long as you've created your modules and your lesson plans and you've got that plan there and you know what you're doing, then you can create the sales page, go into the launch, start with your first module and you can be creating content as you go. As long as you know within yourself that you'll be able to keep up with that. Uh, if you do create it all at once and it's pre-recorded, then that gives your clients more flexibility in how they take it, working around their schedule. But then it also can be a case where people get overwhelmed because they've got access to everything all at once. So now that you've got this plan and you've decided how you're going to be delivering it, then you have to think about how the, the platform... The... The easiest way, the most straightforward, the one that's got the least barrier to entry are using autoresponders. Uh, the pros is that it's simple. Uh, you basically have to have a, an email marketing newsletter tool like MailChimp, Aweber, GetResponse. You create emails and you can create a sequence of emails so that they'll automatically get delivered. So it's simple, it's relatively inexpensive depending on how many people you get signing up. And it's quick, it's just creating an email. The cons though is that it's less flexible and there's no ongoing central access. So basically you've got text and you've got video, you can send them to a page or, but then if you have to send them to a page then you're all of a sudden having to worry about security and not letting anyone be able to log into that. So if you're sending just emails to people who have signed up, you've basically got what you've got accessible within the email and there's no central place for people to come. They have to make sure that they take care of the emails, that they don't lose the emails, that they're there for them to access ongoing. So the next way is a membership site, and that's one of the more popular ways of creating content, of creating a course. It's flexible, it's professional, it gives you a central place to send your clients to where they can access. It's their membership hub where they can access all of their content for as long as you decide to give them access for. It is more complex though. There are a vast number of options out there. People will give you pros and cons. There's not time in this presentation to actually discuss the various options. That would be a whole other presentation. And it does require more setup. And if you're new to this, then it'll take you some time to get used to, to get, load up all of your content, to work out how people are gonna get access to it, to troubleshoot any customer access, and it'll require you to be flexible and take lots of deep breaths. 
And the final option is a hosted learning management system. They're becoming more, more and more popular now. And this behaves more like an online university, so to speak. Uh, it's focused on the learning experience, so you're taking people through step by step. There's no jumping around for them. They have to go from one module to the next to the next. And you'll get more features, things like quizzes and polls, and you can restrict access to the next module until they've done a survey or a quiz or a little test or something, and that helps you to know that they're, they're keeping on track. The cons are, though, that it's more expensive, and if it's a hosted platform and it's not specifically on your site, it means that you may be locked in, your content may be locked into that platform, and you'll find it difficult if you're not happy with a platform down the track, or you outgrow it, or it becomes too expensive, and you want to move to something more fully featured, then you've got some growing pains, perhaps. So you really just need to make it happen. You can talk about it, like we did, for a couple of years, but until you announce it, you can continue talking about it for another few years. So you really need to get some accountability buddies, whether it's a mastermind group that you're in, um, a fellow business owner, or announce it to your current clients, however you want to do it. By announcing it, then you're going to make it real for you. And you just need to do it. Just need to jump in. Go for it. Try it out. The worst that can happen is that no one signs up, so you go back to the drawing board and you start again. So if you're wondering if doing an online course is for you and if it will work for you, what if you don't have time? I think that's probably the most common one. We're all busy, and until you actually draw a line in the sand and just give that commitment to yourself, you're never going to make that leap into doing something that can be so revelationary for you. Uh, at the beginning of this year, I went to Pressnomics in the US, in Phoenix, and the very first speaker on the first day said that in their company, they take 30 days each year, and they put all client work aside, and everyone gets to work on their own projects. And they see what works, what doesn't work, they throw away the things that don't work. But out of that, there are always some new ideas that come out that will spur growth in the company. And when I heard that, I sent my husband a text message and I said, we're doing the course, we're going to take February off, we're just going to plan it, and we're going to launch in March. And while we had a few teething pains with clients, because we wanted to spend time doing our own stuff, and obviously they want their stuff done, uh, overall it was successful and we did launch in March. What if no one buys the course? Well, I'll be honest and I'll say that we thought we were going to have at least 40 or 50 people sign up to the course because we'd worked it out that that would be great for us. I'd, in some of the groups that I belong to, it's not uncommon to see some of these girls launching and having 50,000 plus launches, which, you know, that, that can be an average salary for a, for a freelancer. And everyone wants that. But it takes time and we've got a small list and so we know that the next time that we run the course, it'll be more successful and it'll just keep growing and growing because we tweak it, we learn, and it's just something that you need to get into and get started. So if no one buys the course, uh, completing step one, that planning phase, well, it almost guarantees sales. It's not 100% guarantee, but if you've done that planning and you've got a good idea of what your customer wants and what you're able to provide, there should be some people that would sign up. And then if it's just a small number, you treat it as a pilot and you see what, ha what worked, what didn't work, tweak it for the next time and just keep going. So what if you think that you don't know enough to teach? That's a struggle, I think, for a lot of people. There will always be people that know less than you. Think about your clients that come to you right now. They're coming to you for your level of expertise because you know how to do something that they don't know how to do. If there's a way that you can take that knowledge that you've got and break it up into a logical way that you can share it with clients who perhaps aren't ready to use your one-on-one -on -one services or that you can share it with more people, you have to do it, seriously. 
When I was in my early 20s, I was a dance instructor at Arthur Murray's, and I only, they told us that we only ever needed to be that one level ahead of our clients so that we could teach them. And I had some really successful students, so it works. What if you don't know how to set it all up? I'd recommend, if you don't know, find someone who does, because I'm lucky that I've got Warren, and so he does all of the technical stuff, and I just have to come up with the ideas. But just start simple. If doing an autoresponder in MailChimp is what you feel comfortable doing right now, just do that. So out, outsource. Whether you know someone, you've got a business partner, if you've got a colleague that you could do a trade with, find a way to make it happen for you. And that's it. Are there any questions? Yes? Have you done any work with uh, online course portals like Udemy? No. Uh, we chose to use the Rainmaker platform and it's only recently introduced the learning management system, so we haven't utilised that functionality yet. So we used it just as a basic membership portal where we created the webinars and we did the webinars live and then at the end of the webinar we upload that content so people either can attend live or they can view the replay later on. Have you, have you looked at Udemy? No. The beauty of Udemy is it has an existing customer base, like hundreds of thousands of people who are browsing for new content that they will buy. Right. It's awesome. Yeah, yes, it is. Well, and so then using Udemy, then you've got an automatic customer base or potential customer base of people that are looking. And a platform. Is it, have you used it? Is it easy to set up? Not as an okay. instructor, but yeah. It, they, it's a standard platform where you upload your content to yep. the templates. And so that's effectively that third option, the learning management system, where it's, like it's hosted and you can just put your content into there. Oh, that's cool. Check it out. Well, that's a good one to try. Yes. Oh, no, I didn't. So um, it's, uh, I wrote in the post that I wrote where the slides are, it's in there. Um, so the URL is the new solopreneur. So it's not open at the moment. It looks like it is because we did, we used a theme from Studio Press that was laid out beautifully and had all of the sections that we needed to be able to take people through, to show what was in the course, to cover any frequently asked questions and to show price points. And we're moving, we're rejigging things. We're always in constant evolution. So at the moment it's not, you know, we're looking at running it in July. So you can have a look at what we did run there. So what was the, the Oh, so the course was like the no code web design course. So we, because we already work with small business owners that are starting out in business and need a website, they, as I'm sure many of you who create websites for people know that people, their expectations are much greater than what their budget usually allows. <laughs> and so I'm being very polite when I say that. <laughs> um, so, for pe and obviously for people who are starting out, I know when I was starting, when I was a life coach, you know, I had already spent thousands of dollars on my training and I didn't really understand what a website would do for me, but I knew I wanted one and look, Back then, this was in 2005, this is 10 years ago, you know, a website cost $5,000 and I just couldn't, couldn't come at that. And there are lots of women, specifically women, that are in that position that don't have that money when they're starting out because their idea is new and they don't know if it's going to work and it's hard to invest that sort of money when you're not earning it yet. So this, the course that we created was for those types of people to be able to learn how to do it themselves. Now some people in doing the course realised that even though it was sort of no code, it was still a bit beyond them because, you know, I know WordPress like the back of my hand in terms of setting up a website. And you don't realise as a beginner how challenging learning how to do that yourself can be. So some people decided that they would hire us to, to finish off their site for them, which was great. So they either learnt how to do it themselves or they learnt and understood what was involved in actually creating a website. And I think that might actually make for better clients. It's, it's almost like a client education process that they've paid for um, to make it easier for future web developers to work with them. Um, I'm interested in the second model, being membership site. Yes. Uh, we've got one client 
Yep. Yeah. Um, and the advantage of the mention model is you can do other things as well as online learning, like you can offer them other services and so on. And I'm just wondering if you've got any recommendations for membership plugins or best systems you found that have worked um, for the membership plugin? Yeah, so we, um, like I said, we use the Rainmaker platform uh, from Copyblogger. Uh, there are things like Optimize Press with Optimize Member. There's Zippy Courses, uh, Derek Halpin creates Zippy Courses. Um, oh, I wish I could bring Warren up now because he's more knowledgeable about this than I am. Uh, I think that if you were to just type in um, membership platforms, um, self-hosted or WordPress membership platforms, there are quite a number of them available and it's a matter of looking at the pros and cons of what functionality you need versus what they offer and if you've got um, some sort of forum somewhere where you can ask other people for their experience with them and what they liked, what they didn't like, how it worked for them, then that can help you to um, get an, a better idea of what to use and what will work. Hi. Um, sorry. sorry. Oh, okay, sorry. We didn't do any. We just jumped straight on in, I'll be honest. Yeah, we didn't do any sort of um, discussion about that. You know, I, both Warren and I have done, you know, the certification for in training and how to train people. And we have like the why, what, how, what if, you know, t format sort of to base the training on. And uh, actually, I'll put it in my blog post, I haven't yet, but there was an article that I saw the other day on Flying Solo that talked about how to structure your content, that 80% of it should be the doing of the content and 20% should, well, the, sorry, the time that a student spends, 20% of it should be the learning part and consuming the content and 80% of it should be the actual doing of it because it's in the doing that you get the best learning, not just sitting in front of a video and watching a video. Can you talk a little bit about how you encourage that? Because you were talking about recording content and Well, it's really up to them. Um, in each module, we went through a logical sequence of what we do when we create a website and Basically, that covers. Sorry. Did you have assignments for them? No, because the doing is in them actually like creating their website for themselves. So the very first module is looking at you know registering your domain name, doing your hosting, um, installing WordPress securely, and so Warren showed them how to do all of that. Basically, uh, screen sharing, so they can see what they're actually going to experience when they go and do it themselves because that's one of the hardest things is people not knowing when they get to some screen for something that they're setting up if they've never seen it before it's it can be overwhelming they don't know where to look whereas by him doing the webinar and he's showing them where they need to look and what parts they need to do what parts they can leave for later then we had a Q&A webinar at the end of each week where so they had the the time to do it live, they had, or if they wanted to do it during the week, and then if they had any questions after the webinar, then they had the opportunity during the Q&A to ask those specific questions, and we had a forum as well where they could ask additional questions and get help, specific help. So because this was our first time running it as well, there were some people who sent us direct emails. They felt a little bit shy asking the questions in the forum, and you know, that's understandable, that's okay. Uh, they sent us direct questions to ask for help and there were some things that I know that Warren actually did either talk, give them you know, more specific instruction or he helped them out and, and gave them a little hand. Cool. Any more questions? Yes. Um, a quick question about um, whether you did any competitor research. Uh, I suspect there are a few programs about how to apply the website, the website how to Did, did we do any market research? Uh, we 
I don't think we did. <laughs> well, I mean, look, other than, oh, you know, Warren can still answer, but other than because we're in that space and just seeing what other people are offering, and sometimes it's hard for me to do any in-depth research as to what other people are offering because for me, I look at it and I think, oh, if there are already other people doing it, what's the point of me doing it? And that's a really difficult one to overcome if you feel that way because it was difficult for me. But at some point, I think you just have to switch off and understand that you have a tribe of people that are already listening to what you have to say and they like the way you deliver things and they'll take, it, they'll take the learning best from you. There could be a hundred other courses teaching exactly the same thing, but if they're your tribe, then they want to hear it from you. They don't, want to hear, they don't necessarily know that there are these other things that exist or they don't want to hear it from someone else. They want to hear it from you. So, but, okay. And the other thing as well is that if there are already people doing something either exactly or similar to what you're doing, then that means that there's a market. And I have to keep telling myself this, that there's plenty of business to go around. I, I, I'll be honest, I don't always believe that. And I do sometimes feel that you know, if someone goes somewhere else, then that means I'm missing out. But that, in reality, that's not the case at all. You know, if you surveyed all of the people that are here at WordCamp this weekend, there are lots of people who are making websites. We're all making websites, the majority of us. So why does someone start making websites? Why do they go into business making websites when there are hundreds of other people making websites? So everyone's got a different spin, everyone's got a different style. But market research would be good, <laughs> a little bit. Oh, there you go. Um, Anthony's talking about that tomorrow, is he? I think he comes yeah. up and you can also, with that, extend it with a body called WooCommerce Group. So if you want to have, like, sectioned off different marketing courses and different access levels, you can use that plugin too. And there's also a plugin in your, like, company called Skyverge, which is going to be called Memberships. And it's kind of doing what Group sells, but in a lot easier to use way. So, yeah, Heaps, heaps of options. Yeah. Cool. So thank you very much for your talk, Helen. Thank you. Thank you.